To understand the relevance of sustainability in general, and SDG 15, life on land in particular, think of Robinson Crusoe. When you live alone on a deserted island, you can use the abundant natural resources at your liking. However, when many other Robinsons join you on the island, the shared resources become scarce and may easily degrade or get exhausted. This is called the tragedy of the commons. To avoid it, coordination and collaboration are required, so that all Robinsons can meet their needs. Applied to the business context, companies need to sustainably manage their natural resources, which implies setting up arrangements to avoid the exhaustion and degradation of vital ecosystems. My research revolves around organizing collective action to preserve shared natural resources, such as pristine forests and marine life. In particular, I study the role of business organizations and their stakeholders to tease out what combinations of mechanisms and influences lead to environmentally and socially sustainable outcomes. One of these mechanisms is the use of certified sustainability standards, such as organic or fair trade labels. In this video, I will explain what it takes to design and enforce effective sustainability standards. Many firms use standards which signal that goods and services were produced under sustainable, environmental and social conditions. This is critical because consumers and other stakeholders cannot directly observe or experience the production conditions. Sustainability standards fill this information gap. Today, hundreds of certification schemes exist for a large variety of products, ranging from agricultural products to garment manufacturing and office buildings. While sustainability standards are potentially very useful, they may encounter two types of problems. First, standard adopters may pretend to pursue noble objectives to reap advantages such as a price markup while not living up to their promises. This is also known as policy practice decoupling. Greenwashing, that is making false or unsubstantiated environmental claims, is one example. Second, standard setters may design and enforce environmental and social criteria that do not or only partially, contribute to sustainable outcomes. Sustainability is a multi-interpretable term that harbors complex interactions, so standards may easily use the wrong criteria, overlooking certain factors and overestimating others. This comes under the banner of means and decoupling. In this case, they will insufficiently contribute to a standard's aspired objectives, even if standard adopters are fully compliant. A complication is that standards seeking to remedy the first problem of not complying with the standard's criteria easily become overly rigid, which undercuts the ability to address the second problem of not having, for example, flexible standards that are tailored to local ecosystems. So how to go about this dilemma and design and enforce effective standards? First, it is important that standards sufficiently specify their rules, incentivize their adopters and offer guidance as to desired practices. Firms, consumers and other stakeholders need to know what a standard really stands for. This implies that a basic set of criteria need to be met by all adopters. Think of avoiding certain pesticides and forced labor. Second, on top of these universal requirements, standards need to accommodate the specificities of local contexts. Some regions are water abundant, while others face water shortages, and standards should be tailored to accommodate these variances. 
Third, since sustainability relates to complex biological and social interactions, the overall impact of criteria needs to be considered. This implies looking not only into the direct expected effects, but also the indirect and delayed outcomes of measures. For instance, standards may need to consider not only the tree replacement rate, that is, the difference between felling and replanting trees, but also the impact on soil quality and biodiversity, which eventually also impact future tree growth. Fourth, since many firms adopt sustainability standards for instrumental reasons, that is, to earn extra money or not lose a market, getting adopters to internalize a standard's objectives is crucial in achieving the envisaged objectives. Intrinsically motivated adopters will look for solutions that are compatible with the local environmental and social needs and often have the local knowledge and ingenuity to implement the more effective practices. In sum, sustainability standards can play an important role in flagging and effectuating more environmentally and socially beneficial business activities. The impact is highest when such standards are rigid enough, that is precisely design and enforce criteria, but also flexible enough that is, reflect the diversity and dynamics of the local contexts. So both the latter and the spirit of sustainability standards greatly matter. We are not Robinson Crusoe living on a deserted island. We must collaborate to protect, restore and wisely use the Earth's natural resources. I invite you, as future decision makers, to fully use your ability to responsibly manage those resources.